lads and ladies, welcome to the Junior Classics. Hi there, I'm Sir Bradley Hassey, a teller of borrowed tales. Join me as I share stories of courage, adventure, and wonder. But don't take my word for it. You can find out for yourself on today's Junior Classic. Welcome back, Junior Scholars. I am Sir Bradley Hassey, guardian of the written word and your guide through the Junior Classics. As always, our mission is to safeguard the wisdom in the classics and inspire children and families with a love of good reading and a real and lasting interest in Western literature, history, and scholarship. Recently, we've had a significant bump up in listeners, so if this is your first time listening, thank you for joining us. And of course, a very special thank you to my loyal listeners and Patreon supporters who tune in each and every episode and help us grow the show. Today's episode is another tale from India called The Rat's Wedding by Flora Annie Steele. But before we get to the show, a few announcements. Uh, Don't forget the Junior Classics Art Project. After you listen to the story or while you listen to the story, do an art project of your choosing based on what you liked and then ask your parents to take a picture of it and send it to junior classics podcast at gmail.com once i receive a bundle of them i want to make a video to display your artwork and talk about what i like about it also if you like the show and you want more of it consider supporting us on patreon or unauthorized.tv okay now it's time for lost and found words I have some wonderful words for you today. Our first word describes a rat, the main character in our story, and he is described as economical. Economical means to give good value or service in relation to the amount of money, time, or effort spent. Put another way, you're getting a lot for a little. Other words that mean the same thing would be reasonable, budget, efficient or bargain. Our rat is also described as an officious rat. Officious means you are showing confidence of authority in an annoyingly domineering way, especially in regard to petty or trivial matters. So another way you could say this is if someone is making a big deal out of nothing, they could be considered officious. Can you think of anybody you know who is officious? I sure can, but let's move on to our next word. Our rat also strikes a bargain with a potter. A potter is a person who makes pottery, and the potter in our story gives the rat a pipkin. A pipkin is a small earthenware pot or pan, so basically a little clay pot. Our next word is oblige. Oblige means to make someone legally or morally bound to an action. Other words that mean the same thing are require, compel, make, or force. Do your parents oblige you to complete any house chores? I know we oblige our children to. And our last word today is palanquin. A palanquin is a covered litter for one passenger, consisting of a large box carried on two horizontal poles by four or six bears. So this is basically a carriage that someone would ride in and other people carry them. If you've ever seen the cartoon movie Robin Hood, at the beginning, Prince John and Sir Hiss are carried in a carriage by rhinoceros soldiers. Their carriage is very similar to a palanquin. All right, that's all for our lost and found words. Now on to the show. The Rat's Wedding by Flora Annie Steele. Once upon a time, a fat, sleek rat was caught in a shower of rain, and being far from shelter, he set to work and soon dug a nice hole in the ground, in which he sat as dry as a bone, while the raindrops splashed outside, making little puddles on the road. Now, In the course of digging, he came upon a fine bit of root, quite dry and fit for fuel, which he set aside carefully. For the rat is an economical creature. 
in order to take it home with him. So, when the shower was over, he set off with the dry root in his mouth. As he went along, daintily picking his way through the puddles, he saw a poor man vainly trying to light a fire, while a little circle of children stood by and cried piteously. Goodness gracious, exclaimed the rat, who was both soft-hearted and curious. What a dreadful noise to make. What is the matter? The children are hungry, answered the man. They are crying for their breakfast, but the sticks are damp. The fire won't burn, and so I can't bake the cakes. If that is all your trouble, perhaps I can help you, said the good-natured rat. You are welcome to this dry root, and I warrant it will soon make a fine blaze. The poor man, with a thousand thanks, took the dry root, and in his turn presented the rat with a morsel of dough as a reward for his kindness and generosity. What a remarkably lucky fellow I am, thought the rat, as he trotted off gaily with his prize, and clever too. Fancy making a bargain like that, food enough to last me five days in return for a rotten old stick. Wow, what it is to have brains. Going along, hugging his good fortune in his way, he came presently to a potter's yard, where the potter, leaving his wheel to spin round by itself, was trying to pacify his three little children, who were screaming and crying as if they would burst. My gracious, cried the rat, stopping his ears. What a noise! Do tell me what it is all about. I suppose they are hungry, replied the potter ruefully. Their mother has gone to get flour in the bazaar, for there was none in the house. In the meantime, I can neither work nor rest because of them. Is that all? answered the officious rat. Then I can help you. Take this dough, cook it quickly, and stop their mouths with food. The potter overwhelmed the rat with thanks for his obliging kindness, and choosing out a well-burned pipkin, insisted on his accepting it as a remembrance. The rat was delighted at the exchange, and though the pipkin was just a trifle awkward for him to manage, he succeeded, after infinite trouble, in balancing it on his head, and went away gingerly, tink-a-tink, tink-a-tink, down the road, with his tail over his arm for fear he should trip on it. And all the time he kept saying to himself, What a lucky fellow I am, and clever too, such a hand at a bargain. By and by, he came to where some cowherds were herding their cattle. One of them was milking a buffalo, and having no pail, he used his shoes instead. Oh, fee, oh, fie, cried the cleanly rat, quite shocked at the sight. What a nasty, dirty trick. Why don't you use a pail? For the best of all reasons, we haven't got one, growled the cowherd, who did not see why the rat should put his finger in the pie. If that is all, oblige me by using this pipkin, for I cannot bear dirt. The cowherd, nothing loath, took the pipkin and milked away until it was brimming over. Then turning to the rat, who stood looking on, said, Here, little fellow, you may have a drink in payment. But if the rat was good-natured, he was also shrewd. No, no, my friend, said he, that will not do. As if I could drink the worth of any pipkin at a draft. My dear sir, I couldn't hold it. Besides, I never make a bad bargain. So I expect you at least to give me the buffalo that gave the milk. Nonsense, cried the cowherd. A buffalo for a pipkin? Who ever heard of such a price? And what on earth could you do with a buffalo when you got it? Why, the pipkin was about as much as you could manage. At this, the rat drew himself up with dignity, for he did not like allusions to his size. That is my affair, not yours. Your business is to hand over the buffalo. So, just for the fun of the thing, and to amuse themselves at the rat's expense, the cowherds loosened the buffalo's halter and began to tie it to the little animal's tail. No, no, he called in a great hurry. 
If the beast pulled, the skin of my tail would come off, and then where should I be? Tie it around my neck, if you please. So, with much laughter, the cowherds tied the halter round the rat's neck, and he, after a polite leave-taking, set off gaily toward home with his prize. That is to say, he set off with the rope, for no sooner did he come to the end of the tether than he was brought up with a round turn. The buffalo, nose down, grazing away, would not budge until it had finished its tuft of grass, and then, seeing another in a different direction, marched off toward it, while the rat, to avoid being dragged, had to trot humbly behind willy-nilly. He was too proud to confess the truth, of course, and, nodding his head knowingly to the cowherd, said, Ta-ta, good people, I'm going home this way. It may be a little longer, but it's much shadier. And when the cowherds roared with laughter, he took no notice, but trotted on, looking as dignified as possible. After all, he reasoned to himself, when one keeps a buffalo, one has to look after its grazing. A beast must get a good belly full of grass, if it is to give any milk, and I have plenty of time at my disposal. So all day long he trotted about after the buffalo, making believe, but by evening he was dead tired, and felt truly thankful when the great big beast, having eaten enough, lay down under a tree to chew the cud. Just then a bridal party came by. The bridegroom and his friends had evidently gone on to the next village, leaving the bride's palanquin to follow. So the palanquin bearers, being lazy fellows, and seeing a nice shady tree, put down their burden and began to cook some food. What detestable meanness, grumbled one. A grand wedding and nothing but plain rice to eat. Not a scrap of meat in it, neither sweet nor salt. It would serve the skin flints right if we upset the bride into a ditch. Dear me, cried the rat at once seeing a way out of his difficulty. That is a shame. I sympathize with your feelings so entirely that if you will allow me, I'll give you my buffalo. You can kill it and cook it. Your buffalo, returned the discontented bears. What rubbish. Who ever heard of a rat owning a buffalo? Not often, I admit, replied the rat with conscious pride. But look for yourselves. Can you not see that I am leading the beast by a string? Oh, never mind the string, cried a great big hungry bear. Master or no master, I mean to have meat for my dinner. Whereupon they killed the buffalo and cooking its flesh, ate their dinner with a relish. Then offering the remains to the rat said carelessly, Here little rat skin, this is for you. Now look here cried the rat hotly. I'll have none of your pottage or your sauce either. You don't suppose I am going to give my best buffalo that gave quarts and quarts of milk, the buffalo I have been feeding all day for a wee bit of rice? No, I got a loaf for a bit of stick. I got a pipkin for a little loaf. I got a buffalo for a pipkin. And now I'll have the bride for my buffalo the bride, and nothing else. By this time, the servants, having satisfied their hunger, began to reflect on what they had done, and becoming alarmed at the consequences, arrived at the conclusion it would be wisest to make their escape while they could. So, leaving the bride in her palanquin, they took to their heels in various directions. The rat, being as if it were left in possession, advanced to the palanquin, and drawing aside the curtain, with the sweetest of voices and best of bows, begged the bride to descend. She hardly knew whether to laugh or to cry. But as any company, even a rat's, was better than being quite alone in the wilderness, she did what she was bidden, and followed the lead of her guide, who set off as fast as could be for his hole. As he trotted along beside the lovely young bride, who, 
by her rich dress and glittering jewels, seemed to be some king's daughter. He kept saying to himself, How clever I am! What bargains I do make, to be sure! When they arrived at his hole, the rat stepped forward with the greatest politeness and said, Welcome, madam, to my humble abode. Pray, step in, or if you will allow me, and as the passage is somewhat dark, I will show you the way. Whereupon he ran in first. But after a time, finding the bride did not follow, he put his nose out again, saying testily, Well, madam, why don't you follow? Don't you know it's rude to keep your husband waiting? My good sir, I can't squeeze into that little hole. Ah, yes, there is some truth in your remark. You are overgrown, and I suppose I shall have to build you a thatch somewhere. For tonight, you can rest under that wild plum tree. But I am so hungry. Dear, dear, everybody seems hungry today. However, that's easily settled. I'll fetch you some supper in a trice. So he ran into his hole, returning immediately with an ear of millet and a dry pea. There, said he triumphantly. Isn't that a fine meal? I can't eat that. It isn't a mouthful. And I want rice pottage and cakes and sweet eggs and sugar drops. I shall die if I don't get them. Oh, dear me. What a nuisance a bride is, to be sure. Why don't you eat the wild plums? I can't live on wild plums. Nobody could. Besides, they are only half ripe and I can't reach them. Rubbish. Ripe or unripe. They must do for you tonight, and tomorrow you can gather a basketful, sell them in the city, and buy sugar drops and sweet eggs to your heart's content. So, the next morning the rat climbed up into the plum tree and nibbled away at the stalks till the fruit fell down into the bride's veil. Then, unripe as they were, she carried them into the city, calling out through the streets, Green plums I sell, green plums I sell. Princess am I, rat's bride as well. As she passed by the palace, her mother the queen heard her voice, and running out recognized her daughter. Great were the rejoicings, for everyone thought the poor bride had been eaten by wild beasts. In the midst of the feasting and merriment, the rat, who had followed the princess at a distance, and had become alarmed at her long absence, arrived at the door, against which he beat with a big knobby stick calling out fiercely, Give me my wife! Give me my wife! She is mine by a fair bargain. I gave a stick, and I got a loaf. I gave a loaf, and I got a pipkin. I gave a pipkin, and I got a buffalo. I gave a buffalo, and I got a bride. Give me my wife! Give me my wife! Ha! Son-in-law, what a fuss you do make, and all about nothing. Who wants to run away with your wife? On the contrary, we are proud to see you, and I only keep you waiting at the door till we can spread the carpets and receive you in style. Hearing this, the rat was mollified, and waited patiently outside while the cunning old queen prepared for his reception, which she did by cutting a hole in the very middle of a stool, putting a red-hot stone underneath, covering it with a stew pan lid, and then spreading a beautiful embroidered cloth over all. Then she went to the door, and receiving the rat with the greatest respect, led him to the stool, praying him to be seated. Ha ha! Dear, dear, how clever I am! What bargains I do make, to be sure, said he to himself as he climbed onto the stool. Here I am, son-in-law to a real live queen. What will the neighbors say? At first, he sat down on the edge of the stool, but even there it was warm, and after a while, he began to fidget, saying, Dear me, mother-in-law, how hot your house is! Everything I touch seems burning. You are out of the wind there, my son. Sit more in the middle of the stool, and then you will feel the breeze and get cooler. But he didn't, for the stew pan lid by this time had become so hot that the rat fairly frizzled when he sat down on it, and it was not until he had left all his tail, half his hair, and a large piece of his skin behind him 
that he managed to escape, howling with pain and vowing that never, never, never again would he make a bargain. Dear, dear, how clever I am, said the rat, right up until he got his behind burned off. You know, I thought the rat was a pretty good guy at the beginning of the story, when he helped the man feed the children, but for some reason, his success went to his head, and before long, he started thinking he was so clever, he deserved whatever he wanted, even a princess as his wife. Well, the wise old queen sure took care of him and taught him a lesson about pride. This story made me think of a proverb that says, if you are proud, you will be destroyed. If you are proud, you will fall. And in the case of the rat's wedding, if you are proud, you will get your behind burned off. Well, that's all for this time, Junior Scholars. Until next time, I am Sir Bradley Hesse. Be brave, be loyal, and speak the truth. Now for you parents out there, I want you to understand why we are doing this, what we are trying to achieve, and how you can help us. This is a rescue operation to preserve the classics and the wisdom within before it is lost forever. Our goal is to inspire children with a love of good reading by safeguarding and breathing new life into the greatest stories in history and empower you, the parents, with a resource you can trust to enrich your child's mind and spirit. We don't want these stories and the wisdom within to be forgotten so our children don't have to learn these lessons on their own. The most important thing you can do for us is to spread the message and tell others about these stories and what we are doing. If you want to donate, we would love that as well. My promise is that 100% of donations will go to building the impact and quality of the Junior Classics. If you have feedback and thoughts on how we can do things better, please send an email to juniorclassicspodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening to the Junior Classics.